say one uh, general preliminary thing about this wonderful event, and it is that uh, um, we had, uh, um, Nick Monfort and I at MIT had been thinking about a forum devoted to, the, uh, uh, to electronic embodiments, electro uh, to electronic experiment, digital experiments in literature and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, um, as we began to speak about that, of course, uh, the speakers who are on today's panel jumped to our minds first. Um, and originally, the plan was simply to have a forum devoted to the topic of our final uh, uh, session this afternoon, it, uh, electronic literature and future books. Uh, but um, I, when when uh, uh, I got word of the existence in uh, within MIT of these uh, uh, gifted uh, and wonderful young colleagues, the uh, our wonderful organizers of this conference, we got together and we began to talk about expanding the event, and 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 that's the event that's come here. And I wanted to mention this in part because both. Rita and Kate Hales were very uh, accommodating to us by agreeing for one, one thing at a fairly late stage after plans had been made to postpone their arrival by a day and to take part in the full day's discussion. Uh, my hope and my expectation is that you'll find today this, this final forum in some degree uh, returning to some of the themes that have already arisen in, in our discussion today and also to extend them into areas that we haven't yet touched upon. Uh, our, as, as many of you surely know, our speakers today are among the pioneers in the territory of digital creativity, digital literature. Uh, they will speak in the order in which I will introduce them. Uh, each speaker will, will follow the format we've been uh, using earlier, although all three of my speakers have promised me that they will stay within their time limits to give us time for a rousing discussion, and I hope we will have that. Uh, uh, they will each speak for a, a brief time, and then we will open the uh, conversation to all of you. Um, our first speaker uh, is one of the great figures in this emerging field, Catherine Hales. As uh, she's a professor of literature and co-director of the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke, uh, where she's taught for some time. And her distinguished books include Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary, My Mother Was a Computer, Digital Subjects and Literary Texts, and most recently, How We Think, Digital Media and Contemporary Technogenesis. Uh, Catherine will uh, uh, open the uh, uh, discussion with a presentation, uh, and uh, she will be followed by Rita Rayleigh, who is associate professor of English at the state at the University of California in Santa Barbara, where she directs transcriptions, an online publication devoted to the digital humanities. She's the author of Tactical Media, Electronic. Mediations and co editor of the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 2, with several other co editors. Uh, and as anyone who's interested in the field knows, both Kate's work and, and Rita's work is very widely cited and has been already very influential. Our final speaker is uh, one of MIT's most re uh, luminous newly tenured young young faculty members, Nick Monfort, uh, and uh, uh, Nick's uh, imaginative work has already, in some respects, transformed comparative media studies at MIT. He's an associate professor of digital media here and president of the Electronic Literature Organization. Uh, he's written widely about on, uh, uh, and created many digital media projects um, uh, uh, and uh, among his publications are, are uh, uh, Ream, a 500-page poem written amazingly in one day. Uh, his latest book, Riddle and Bind, contains literary riddles and constrained poems, as he describes them. He's also the author of Twisty Little Passages, an Approach to Interactive Fiction. I be we'll begin then with Kate. Thank you, David, for that introduction. And I, too, wish to thank the organizers of our conference. Apophenia, a lovely word that means finding patterns in random data. 
It marks the territory of conspiracy theories. It defines the province of paranoia. And it names the risks endemic to literary criticism. <laughs> On occasion, it can also serve as a stimulus for artistic creativity, as it did with William Gibson in his book, Pattern Recognitions and as it has for David Clark in his net art piece, 88 Constellations for Wittgenstein. This is the opening screen. You can see it's a Mercator-like projection of constellations. As you mouse over the various constellations, threads appear defining the threads that connect the different stars, and then you can click on one of those stars to enter the constellation. Constellation is an interesting metaphor here because uh, ancient peoples looked in the sky and thought that the groupings of stars define mythical figures. But astronomers know that the stars named in those constellations have no necessary spatial uh, contiguity, nor do they have any necessary relationship. So constellations are a very ancient form of finding patterns that the data themselves do not uh, justify. So among the patterns that David Clark suggests in his work are these. The number 88, there are 88 constellations, but also there are 88 piano keys. Wittgenstein's brother lost his right arm in World War I, and he previously to that was a concert pianist. After losing his right arm, he began to commission pieces for the left hand. And you can uh, trigger some animations in this work using your left hand on the computer. Eight uh, also names H as the eighth letter of the alphabet. One of the episodes is about the fact that German soccer teams don't use the number 88 on their jerseys because 88 could be read as HH, which in Nazi circles would mean Heil Hitler. And then imagine 88 lying on its side, it now becomes infinity doubled. So this gives you an example of how different uh, facts are being put together into threads with the suggestion of patterns. So let's take a look at one of these eights, April 1889. And you'll see this constellation includes stars on Charlie Chaplin, Adolf Hitler, and so forth. These are Count your lucky animations. stars. Ludwig Wittgenstein, Charlie Chaplin, and Adolf Hitler were all born in April 1889 within days of each other. The tramp, the dictator, and the thinker. Three stars to set the compass of 20th century history by. Ludwig was born into one of the richest families in Europe, but he gave all his money away. Charlie was born into a poor theater family in London and made his enormous fortune in the flicks. Hitler was middle class all the way. Ludwig Wittgenstein and Adolf Hitler went to school together in 1904. After two of his older brothers committed suicide, it was decided that Ludwig should be allowed to venture outside the confines of the glittering fin de siècle Wittgenstein palace and into the real world. And that is how he came to the real school in Linz a technical high school that allowed him to pursue his enthusiasm for engineering and all things mechanical. And as it happened, the young Adolf Hitler was attending the same school, the school where he would whet his appetite for anti-Semitism. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, at the real school, to be sure, I did meet one Jewish boy who was treated by all of us with caution. And perhaps, just perhaps, this Jewish boy was Ludwig Wittgenstein, a stuttering, assimilated Jew, the son of wealth and privilege who had a propensity even then for indiscriminately confessing his sins. Other episodes here uh, point out the fact that Charlie Chaplin made the film The Great Dictator, in which he played both the surrogate for Hitler and the Jewish barber who stands in as a double for Hitler. And the Chaplin had a particular grudge against Hitler because he felt that he had stolen his mustache. <laughs> Another episode points out that uh, 
Hitler's grandfather or grandmother served as a maid in the Baron Rothschild household. She discovered that she was pregnant, so there's the suggestion that there may in fact have been Jewish blood in Hitler's own family line. He was concerned enough about that to send a detective to uh, find out if it was true. So you can see here the way that the episodes work. There's a voiceover which mostly relays facts, and then the cultural context is largely given to us through the images and the annotations. 8-8 eight, eight is, of course, a double number, and we'll see the interplay between those facts and um, the way the images work in this playful, punning uh, episode called Doubles. Oops, sorry. I need to play this. Double. Double U. Double cross. Double negative. Double positive. Double trouble. One and one. One plus one. One thing and another. One thing next to another. The same thing, but different. Sameness and difference together. Repeating, 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 and repeating. Science is repeating, repeating. Science is repeating. Science is repetition. You can say that again. You have to say that again. Say that again. I can't hear you. Show me. Show me one thing and another thing, same or different. The first one could be an accident. The second one was a confirmation. Proof. Repetition. Repetition and proof. Body doubles. Double time. Doubles in your dreams. Freud tells us that a double in a dream is the phallus. The double is the phallus. The phallus is one thing. One thing and not another thing. One and zero. Zeros and ones. Double positive. Double negative. Logic is a double negative. Things are not true and false. They are merely false and not not true. There are knowns and there are unknowns. There are unknown knowns, and there are unknown unknowns. After the first, one could still believe it was an accident. Only the second attack confirmed the terrorist attack. W. 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 Two U's. You were always at least two people, perhaps more. Once, when Wittgenstein was working in his cottage in Ireland, a neighbor came by and was surprised to find him alone after hearing talking. I replied, I was talking to a very dear friend of mine, myself. That was how Wittgenstein... So there are too many allusions in this uh, episode to Wittgenstein's work for me to completely elucidate them. But you may have noticed in those double squares that appear in the center, in the background is the famous shower scene from Psycho. We see Janet Leigh, Janet Leigh, who had a double in that scene, taking the shower and then Anthony Perkins approaching uh, vaguely. We can see him through the shower curtain. Another episode is on Anthony Perkins and points out the fact that he had a double life in a double sense that um, he uh, was identified with Norman Bates, his most famous role, and in that sense he was double. But he had another double life because in an age of homophobia, he was gay and he had to try to project the image of a heterosexual leading man. In 1991, Anthony Perkins died of AIDS. 10 years later, his widow is on the plane that flies into the Twin Towers. So the Twin Towers also appear in this episode. Uh, in another episode, they're linked to uh, the obelisk in 2001. What's the difference between coincidence and science repetition? But here we have a focus only on the double, so we're riding along the edge of apophenia and proof. Um, in this equivocal figure that you see here, the two female faces animated to appear to be talking to one another, we get that linked with the Wittgenstein anecdote. And in philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein argued that the meaning of a word is in its use. So 
broadly construed, we could say that Clark here is working with the voiceover as facts, but it's the contextualization of the images and the animations that give those facts specific meanings within this work. Now let's go to a star in another galaxy far, far away, David Markson's print novel, Wittgenstein's Mistress. The sole character in this novel is a protagonist we know only as Kate, and Kate believes that she is the last person in the world. And she sits day after day typing sentences that occur to her on her typewriter, and these sentences constitute the novel. Here's a sample. The young woman is asleep in a painting in the Metropolitan Museum. She's thinking of a painting by Vermeer she saw. There's something wrong with that sentence too, of course. There being no young woman either, but only a representation of one. Which is again why I'm generally de delighted to see the tennis balls. So you can see the radical disjunctions here between these paragraphs that seem to make no sense. And yet, as we continue to read this narrative, we begin to get some hints about why Kate is in this condition, either as a fantasy or as an actuality. It seems to have something to do with the death of her son and her subsequent separation from her husband, whose name she can only intermittently remember. So from a certain point of view, we could say that Kate is trapped in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein's first early work. Wittgenstein later came to doubt the wisdom of the positions he argued in the Tractatus, which proposed that logic could be used to solve most philosophical problems. Much later and posthumously, Wittgenstein wrote philosophical investigations in which he argued that there were only language games and that these language games acquired meaning owning only in their social and biological context. So Kate's belief that she's the only person in the world literalizes the impossibility of a private language that Wittgenstein asserted in philosophical investigations. If the meaning of language is in fact in social context, and there was no social context, there was only a single person, then language could not have any meaning at all. But of course, we as readers recuperate that language as a, as a reading community, and we struggle to find a pattern amidst Kate's meditations. So now, putting constellations and mistress together, what kinds of patterns might we see? Well, in the constellations, images serve as context. In the novel, they're represented through ekphrasis, the verbal representation of visual phenomena. In constellations, it's primarily the animations that create connections between these coincidental events and therefore suggest patterns. In Mistress, the paragraphs are disconnections, and it's only as we read on through the narrative that we ourselves as readers begin to construct the threads that might constitute a pattern. So we can say that Constellations begins with fragments and builds towards some elusive whole, while the novel, being a novel, begins with the presumption of some kind of coherent whole, but shatters that by breaking the text into fragments. So my conclusion is this, that each of these works becomes resistant and experimental within the tradition it, uh, they have located themselves. So for David Clark, working in the tradition of net art, which is often fragmentary, viewed for a few minutes by visitors to a museum installation, for example, he begins with fragments, but he rewards readers who stayed with him by suggesting there is an elusive whole that we nevertheless can't grasp or articulate. Markson, working in the tradition of the novel, defeats that tradition by breaking it into fragments, but then allowing readers to imagine these threads do connect into some kind of explanation of Kate's condition. In other words, we can understand these works as resistant experimental works only within the traditions in which they work, a mode of analysis that I've elsewhere called media-specific analysis. That's the pattern that I see, but then again, 
Perhaps I myself am suffering from apophenia. Thank you. Sorry, I just have to find my PowerPoint, actually. It was loaded for me, but I don't know where. Do you, is the person who did the loading available? Sorry to cut into our time. Well, while, while this is happening, let me just start by thanking. Use the mic. You have to use the mic. Sorry. While this is happening, let me start by thanking David for including me on this panel. Um, I'm honored to join such illustrious company as, as um, Catherine Hales and Nick Monfort. And of course, let me thank Amaranth and Gretchen for their hard work on what is not only a well-organized conference, but a well-designed conference. So I'm going to start. Now I lost. Sorry, I needed also my... Uh... Well, okay, what I was going to do to start was actually just read or navigate this text, Ian Hatcher's Signal to Noise, so that my initial remarks would be more meaningful. So um, what you could imagine is that if I were reading, I would be mousing over these highlighted words, and what would be revealed to me are paths, um, options that I could take, pursue, and so forth, and then the narrative would start to unfold at the bottom of the screen. Okay. I begin to read, explore, play with, Ian Hatcher's Signal to Noise, part vignette, part interactive fiction, clicking the highlighted key words, bottle, cobweb, and exploring the bifurcated paths each makes available. Open it, leave it, before noticing what seems to be the result of a scripting error at the bottom of what is demarcated as page space. A mishmash of letters and partially realized words in the darkest shades of gray is barely perceptible, upon closer inspection, almost immediately fading into the black background. Suddenly, however, the error seems to be an actual glitch. The ghostly characters become unmoored, animated, the letter forms multiplying and more quickly oscillating between states of visibility and invisibility, fading, shifting position, dissolving the words that might have been back into letter forms. The schematic structure of the text, move the mouse, reveal the readerly choices, is unsettled by these textual ripples. Something is happening to the text. Something has disturbed it. It takes a few seconds and a scan of the info page to realize that it is not something, but someone who has entered into and is now directly affecting my reading space, which is no longer mine alone. I did not elect to listen to the radio, but someone has. Someone not present, but telepresent. If on the initial passage through the text, I looked out the window onto a horizon to find an empty sea, the solitary aspect of my work confirmed by the mirrored surface that reflects only my own image, now I am in the presence of another reader. The sea is no longer empty, and another boat, another reader, is moored not far away. This person and I are, in short, reading together, concurrently, in real time. I have not encountered a text that bears the vestiges of readings past, marks both discursive and physical, vestiges or footprints left by those who have come before. My reading is instead synchronized with another's, less in the sense of coordination than liveness, a liveness that, as Philip Auslander reminds us, cannot be stabilized practically or ontologically as either live or mediatized, but is rather both and. There is an improvisational quality to the textual, counter in, in textual encounter in Hatcher's signal to noise, what will happen if I open the suitcase. But the encounter of the other reader, of other readers, is a script that, once identified, can itself be read. What is coded into the text, then, the structural logic that has to be materially recognized before a successful reading can be accomplished, is the sociality of reading. 
But the question is how or to what extent is it differently social from print reading practices from the whole host of clubs, associations, and interpretive communities that have been developed to decode, make sense of, and importantly, to share the experience of reading books and other documents. On the face of it, the message of signal to noise, reading is an inherently social practice, might be regarded as familiar and even reiterative, enacting and thereby materializing an idea that is already known to us. But I think it is rather the case that, absent a live socket connection, the simulation of concurrence and simultaneity, such that they are experienced as actual, is itself generative. It's one thing to encounter the traces of prior readers, and quite another to recognize the co-presence of other readers, unexpected, unseen, but not unfelt. In such moments, latency, the temporal lag that we accept as axiomatic for our online engagements, seems to have been eliminated. The gap between action and response closed, and the potential for strange, disturbing, and otherwise wonderful intersubjective encounters opened. More concretely, consider the narcissism, Talon Mehmet's neologistic formulation for our fetishistic attachment to the enclosed circuits linking the human subject and the computational apparatus. The interface here is mirrored surface. Narcissisms, as Mehmet explains, privilege local space over remotional attachment, selfish constructs that position the subject as island rather than nodal point of networked communication circuits. If there has been a conceptual turn in electronic literature at all within the last decade, my suggestion is that it has been from the lamentation, celebration, and critique of such narcissisms, human and machine coupled in a terminal embrace, to an articulation of systems writ large, matrices of distributed but interconnected nodes, entities, bodies, devices, that are as much about the nodes themselves as they are about the flows among them matrices then that are at once mediated and lively. In contradistinction to the narcissism then, signal to noise foregrounds remotional attachments, those formed as a consequence of recognizing, making oneself available, and responding to the other readers, the, ent the other entities contained within it. Liveness, as I am outlining it here, is one of at least three aspects of the sociality of reading in our contemporary media ecology. Another would be the social book, so it's fortuitous that I'm following Bob Stein. So the social book, collaborative production or distributed authorship, network novels in which it is not simply the case that user contributions are mined as source text, but that the temporal frame of collaboration is continuous. Sender and receiver remain spatially and temporally distinct, but there is a sense in which the textual contributions do not lie inert, waiting to be used, but are rather part of an ongoing dynamic exchange among readers and authors. The third aspect of reading as, as the third aspect of, of reading as contemporary social practice more directly bridges electronic literature and the book. And so here I will note that I'm making a uh, tracing a path rather from electronic literature to the unbound book. The development of online reader forums, such as those for Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves and Only Revolutions, and Stephen Hall's Raw Shark Text. These forums in which the books are quite rigorously discussed, collaboratively interpreted, and collectively produced as cultural totems. In this context, a discussion thread is no mere guide or map with which to navigate a distinct textual object. The forums are not conceptually stationed outside the book proper, not belated or posterior to, but are in no small measure mutually constitutive. In other words, they're not parasitic, but rather symbiotic. Indeed, it's not for nothing that Danielewski should have a dedicated atelier to assist with his present project, The Familiar. For all of the care devoted to the production of these books, House of Lee's Only Revolutions, Raw Shark Texts, etc., for all the care devoted to the production of these books that I note as singular material objects, their layout and design, their incorporation of visual elements, their exploitations of the resources of codex, they are in fact expanded books. 
their discursive fields extending beyond page and spine, unbound in this other sense, books that encompass negative chapters, books that encompass negative chapters still to be produced, much less discovered, translations and adaptations to film or even opera that are themselves enfolded within the expanded field of the book. The expanded book is not codex, not digital, not game, not conversation, not collaborative content creation, but that which is situated in the interstitial field. Rosalind Krauss, in her definitive statement on sculpture in the expanded field, notes that, quote, we had thought to use a universal category to authenticate a group of particulars, but the category has now been forced to cover such a heterogeneity that it is itself in danger of collapsing, end quote. No such diffusion or definitional collapse results from the articulation of the expanded book because its imagined expansion, as well as, as well as its imagined destruction, is dependent on the idea of the book as its very condition of possibility. The expanded book, the cumulative effect of that which it is not, the not codex, not digital, not game, not conversation, not collaborative con content creation, is already an abstraction even as it maintains a tenuous, flexible link to the material substrate out of which it emerges. The expanded book is an abstraction, but I would say a productive one, because it allows us to think across media, platforms, genres, modes, and to conceive of the expanded book in terms of reading and writing practices. Put another way, the unbound book, here, for, here reformulated as expanded, is not about ordinary rending or exclusively about transcription or remediation, but it is also importantly about another kind of unbinding, a categorical untethering, an opening up toward the sheer variety of reading and writing practices that are not formalizable as either book or electronic literature. We know well that codex, like cinema and, single, and the single screen theater, is no longer the exclusive or even proprietary vehicle for the transmission of its content. The book then is one component part of our contemporary textual environments, the book in its expanded field, but no less significant or singular for being such. Pache, the new aesthetic, the book, codex, like other analog media, such as cassette tapes and Super 8 film, is a richly productive site for creative experimentation and play. The expanded book, on the other hand, is a richly productive site for critical exploration. Like the shadow text of Signal to Noise, it is ephemeral, lively, and vernacular, both common and held in common. It is, in short, where reading and writing is actually taking place. Thank you. That didn't seem to improve things a great deal.
apologize for the te can you hear me? I apologize for the technical glitch, but I forgot to make a, a technical announcement when I first introduced our speakers. I'd like to do it now while Nick is trying to fix his computer. Um, <laughs> Someone in our group has lost uh, an olive green LL Bean hooded raincoat. If you see it, pick it up and take it to the registration desk out in the atrium. Thank you. Extended desktop would be fine. <laughs> um, okay, it's extending. Okay, so uh, let, me see here. let me go ahead and do this. Oh, it says. Okay. All right. I apologize for the delay. Freedom sometimes has its price. <clears throat> I'm going to speak about this project, 10 print char string 205.5 plus rand 1. Go to 10. Uh, it's a project that I've collaborated on with uh, two others at MIT, Patsy Boudouin and Noah Vauder, and the other individuals named here. There's 10 of us that have uh, written a book about this one line basic program for the Commodore 64. Uh, what does it do? Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the cover of the book that's coming from MIT Press in November. Um, so to figure out what this program does, it's helpful to know what uh, the characters at 205 and 206 look like. They're the left-leaning and right-leaning diagonal line. And then, oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> let's see here. If we actually, uh, we're to start an instance of the Commodore 64. and run it, we would see what happens in response, which is a production of a pattern that looks like a random maze. And uh, so you can see um, that uh, complex uh, rhizomatic networks of textuality uh, might be the topic that uh, uh, Rita Rayleigh is discussing and the 88 uh, constellations related to uh, uh, Wittgenstein might be uh, what uh, Kate Hales has talked about. Um, I can't do 88 constellations, but uh, I can do 38 characters of, uh, of code for the Commodore 64 if I get nine other people to help me. Um, so this is a program that uh, you're invited uh, in the original sources uh, where it is uh, disseminated to, uh, to modify, to, to change. And this program is running on a Commodore 64 uh, out in the lobby, and you're invited to come and do that yourself with it. Let me return to the, this project, and there's, there's just the two major things about it that uh, seem unusual to uh, other people for some reason, um, that it is focusing on a single line of code. Why would one write about a single line of basic? Um, and that it's a, a project by 10 authors written in a single voice. 
So to try to give a context for um, what programming was like around 1982, I wish to share with you an Australian commercial, um, actually just the first nine seconds of it, um, so please don't blink as I start it, uh, uh, that uh, is a commercial for the Commodore 64. And I think wish to share was the right way to put that. Um, so um, that's a big disappointment. But um, the uh, the context of uh, uh, of this uh, program that I'm uh, uh, that I'm looking at that my collaborators are looking at is that of creative computing, a category that includes video gaming, electronic literature, digital art, but also these things that don't ha even have a term or a name. Um, uh, hobbyist uh, programming and uh, recreational computing, um, a, a term that was uh, in use here at MIT in the uh, late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, so this is, this is a program that it's, it's difficult to sort of categorize what it is. Uh, the, I think the best common answer, uh, the, the, the one that I've, I've heard today, um, I mean, it's not a piece of productivity software, you know. It's not a video game. You can't, uh, you can't play it. You can't interact with it. It looks sort of like a screensaver, but that's, and that's a good answer, but it's one that is ahistorical because the, uh, uh, the screensaver hadn't been developed in 1982. No one ever suggested that this was a program to uh, preserve the uh, phosphor display of your system, and it wouldn't be a very good one because it's putting one of two characters in every position on the screen. Um, so uh, what might it be? Uh, I like the answer concrete poem, uh, but I haven't heard that one yet. Um, uh, it's in a, some type of aesthetic production uh, that's being generated automatically, um, and it's it, a very, very concise uh, program to do this. Uh, it's a way to think about what uh, our categories, our conceptual categories about computing are, how people got involved with computers. If people hadn't been doing things like this with computers uh, at any point in history, um, no one would have thought to create ebooks. Uh, it just wouldn't have occurred to anyone because computers would be used for military, scientific, billing purposes, but not for cultural purposes, and not for aesthetic, and not for literary purposes. So that's one of the ways that the system is engaged with, uh, the, specifically, uh, the, uh, the issue of the book. Um, here you see two uh, different emulators with a program has been started and a screenshot has been taken in both cases. <coughs> and uh, one of the things you might notice is that uh, the pattern is exactly the same. Even though it's a random maze, it's one that is actually deterministic. Um, the, the program does not uh, change uh, the seed at the beginning. Uh, you, can, you can reseed the generator off the timer, but it doesn't do that. So you get actually the same thing. And this question of randomness is one that we can examine in this system. We can also think about questions of the material artifact of the Commodore 64 out in the lobby versus the emulator. And what does it mean to have an emulator? In what ways are emulators useful or not? Um, I think of the emulator as uh, a software addition of a computer. And I find that a useful way to think about it because there are additions that are good for different sorts of things. Some of them are scholarly, critical, variorum. Uh, there'd be reasons that you would want to have uh, a particular uh, addition for use in teaching. And um, then, uh, you know, reasons that you want to actually look at uh, the material artifact of, uh, 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 of an early system just as you would an early book. Uh, here's a, a, a great book. Um, <laughs> this is A Million Random Digits by, by the Rand Corporation. Um, very appropriate uh, name for the corporation that, uh, that produced this influential document. Very important document to uh, providing a source of randomness when um, th there was not, uh, it was not, it was not uh, easily available. Uh, random number generation was not easily available otherwise. Um, so uh, I also recommend, I, th there's some really good reviews of this on Amazon, and I suggest <laughs> you, 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 you read them. Um, but the thing about this is that you can see here in the book itself is uh, it doesn't look like, you'd say, well, is this entirely random? Well, well no, it's, it's arranged in a grid. I mean, everything, it's actually in a framework of regularity. And TinPrint, the program that uh, we've examined, uses randomness to select a right-leaning or left-leaning diagonal line. But uh, 
the fact of the grid, the, the way that everything is framed, is very essential to its overall effect. And the fact that the computer runs at the same speed and that this process moves ahead regularly is also important to this effect. So the balance between randomness and regularity and the play between those two is significant in tin print. And it's something that occurs again and again in non-computational art, all sorts of uh, digital art and literature, uh, gaming, and, and other sorts of uses of computing. So this is line as a way into all of that. This is the first uh, occurrence of a program that functions like uh, the tin print program of the title in print. I'm brandishing the book now in which it is printed, the Commodore 64 User's Guide from 1982. And one of the things that's interesting about this is uh, that you are encouraged to modify the program. Um, and this is a book that comes with every Commodore 64 that uh, is sold early on. It's not something special for uh, programmers or the elite. This is another occurrence of this 10 print program, uh, 8 print. There is uh, uh, this is a little uh, item that runs in the, in the magic section of Run Magazine, July 1984, and this is the magazine. Um, and here you can see it circulates. Um, uh, th the way this, this one-line program gets out to people is in print, in a magazine, in a book. Um, that's the way people learn about code like this. And it would be uh, uh, quite uh, uh, obvious uh, for someone to... Uh, Keep this in mind, go to school or another context and uh, share the program from memory as well. These aren't ways that we think of programs being circulated. We think of people memorizing poems and we think of people you know, printing and circulating literary text, but not uh, computer programs. And yet uh, it did happen. And uh, we can see the same thing with Pearl one-liners and other short programs uh, that continues to happen today. So here's a program that um, uh, isn't interactive. It, it does not accept input from the user during execution. Uh, it does not have comments or even variables that might be named significantly by a user. If we wanted to interpret someone's intention based on that, uh, we can't do it in this case. It doesn't have a known author. It just uh, has a corporate author of uh, Commodore. Um, it has no uh, clear, obvious purpose or category that we could identify in terms of the way we think of computing nowadays. But all of the things that it allows us to engage, um, the process of iteration and how that works, um, and what influence it has in computing. How to generate two-dimensional effects from an essentially one-dimensional process that's just going and wrapping around the screen. Uh, randomness uh, and its counterpart regularity, as I mentioned. Uh, the use of character graphics and specific character sets. In this case, an extended version of ASCII called Petsky, unofficially called Petsky, um, that was present on several different Commodore computers. Uh, basic and high-level languages. Uh, basic developed at Dartmouth uh, in 1964. Um, by John Kimeney and Thomas Kurtz, and then implemented by Microsoft for uh, the Altair. Um, and uh, actually, the version of BASIC that uh, you were just seeing work and that is, is, is uh, going on out in the lobby is uh, one written by Bill Gates himself, uh, and uh, actually uh, uh, specifically adapted from his uh, 6502 code by Rick Wieland. So um, uh, that's how uh, this reached people who were Commodore 64 users, users of the most uh, uh, the uh, most popular uh, best-selling uh, single model of computer ever used, uh, ever, uh, ever made. Uh, and the role of the C64 on platforms is also something we can investigate through, the look, through looking at this. Um, as I mentioned, the transmission of programs and questions about uh, mazes and patterns and their use in computing uh, and, and in various uh, places in the arts. So that's why we're doing the project. Uh, to sort of excuse it, uh, even though I can't deploy a great insight about it. Uh, the book is coming in November, and uh, it hopefully will, uh, will satisfy that need. Um, why uh, have 10 authors get together and write in a single voice? So um, w one of the things that, that uh, I would say about this is there's plenty of, of sort of massively authored books, or, or 10 authored books, uh, but they're edited collections, generally. And uh, what happens then is you get a bunch of people together who uh, know uh, a great deal about a topic. Uh, they're experts in the field. They know the scholarly uh, history. Um, but they don't talk to each other. 
as they do their work. They uh, go off to uh, stereotypically a library carol and, uh, and they work uh, individually. And after the book comes out, uh, then they say, oh, you wrote something for that too, didn't you? Um, and uh, we want to do something different. We want to actually have people uh, converse and uh, bring their expertise together in the project. So that's part of the idea. How we did it specifically was um, using some very conventional means and some slightly more recent means. Uh, we had a mailing list and we did a lot of communication uh, on email. Um, and uh, here we had a lot of the higher level discussion or sort of musing about uh, topics which uh, may not have manifested themselves at all in the final book, but were part of our thinking process about it. We also used the media wiki. And uh, um, I should mention that uh, you know, we didn't use this in the sort of free for all, in the sort of imagined free for all Wikipedia mode of uh, put this up and uh, let people from the public come in and say whatever they like and, and do things, uh, work in whatever order. Um, of course, Wikipedia has its own hierarchies, but we uh, did have plenty of ad hoc um, hierarchies uh, in this project to assign particular people to uh, be the lead writer for a chapter, uh, other people to review a chapter that was, uh, that was being uh, worked on. Um, so we had internal stages of review. Um, uh, and um, other uh, types of attention on specific details within, uh, within particular chapters, particular sections, uh, in particular uh, remarks as, uh, as some of our interstitial chapters are called. So my work uh, has involved uh, both academically and in my creative practice um, a great deal of collaboration. I'm not even including the uh, editorial collaboration, which is more conventional, uh, but I've worked with uh, several people, including uh, Kate Hales um, and uh, Noah Ward Fruin and, uh, and others on, uh, on editorial projects collaboratively. But actually co-creating a text and working uh, to produce a single article or book or project um, I, I've done in a variety of different ways with different collaborators and different configurations. Um, and um, it, it, there have been many productive things uh, about this personally and I think in terms of the quality of the work. Uh, and particularly um, whether one's uh, looking at uh, specific technical details of the Atari 2600, which would be very difficult to uh, find someone to fact check uh, if you didn't have another collaborator who was working through that with you. Or uh, if you're writing, uh, for instance, a 2002 word palindrome and um, the ability uh, individually to fall into insanity um, in doing this uh, is very great. But with a collaborator, um, you can figure out which of the text is actually meaningful, should be pursued, should be revised, should be worked on, should be worked into the final text. Um, this isn't the only project that uh, has many writers producing a book in a single voice. In fact, it, it's not only uh, it's not the current one in, in uh, it's not the only one in the current MIT Press catalog. So, um, so uh, I, I wanted to mention this as a topic for conversation um, and uh, as a, something related to the way that books might be produced in the future, not just academic books, but other sorts of books, um, that perhaps there's a, a range of collaborative practices, not only the um, massive and crowdsourced um, sorts of practices, and not only the uh, typical romantic individualistic model, but uh, many things in between uh, that might be productive ways to think together and write together. Thanks very much. So we're now going to uh, throw the uh, conversation open to the audience, and I hope you'll draw on your experience this after, in earlier sessions as well as you pose your questions. Uh, uh, m many of the speakers who, who spoke earlier also should be available here someplace, and I hope m many of you will, will uh, kick in as well. Uh, uh, we'll take part as well. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, uh, let me start with a very naive and, uh, and, and perhaps simple-minded one, Nick, uh, about the project you described. It was hard for me to understand why I would want to read your book. What, what's it about? 
what to, what's its subject? So yeah, I, I, I'm the, the the rough start there uh, probably um, uh, hindered me in explaining uh, what what uh, might in fact um, not not interest you in any case. Um, but uh, the project is to look at creative computing and to do that through the example of this one line program to understand how it was transmitted, how it was uh, typed in, understood by programmers, uh, why people were pleased with the effect that it produced. So, and the, each of the contributors is doing an, the equivalent of a kind of close reading of the of the. Well, all of us are doing that together, uh, although it wouldn't be a close reading in uh, the sense of bracketing off historical and uh, biographical and technical contexts. So we're doing an intensive reading, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but not a new critical close oh, reading. You're aiming for a thick description of <laughs> yes, your code. Yes. Okay. So, and it's the type of book that, um, you know, we see books about single works of art. Uh, in fact, there's a, uh, a series um, that, uh, one work series that MIT Press distributes about single works of art. Here we have something that uh, we don't even know what its name is. When we see a work of art, we know what a gallery is, we know what a museum is, we know what the art world is. We have actually much more to describe about the context of hobbyist computing, so there's even more of a reason to take that close focus. Are we ready for questions? Yes. Hi, this, this question is for Catherine. A little louder. Be sure you use the mic and identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Matthew Rubery. I'm, I teach at the University of London. Um, and this question is for Catherine. Uh, I've, I've been thinking about how uh, many print books have had a lively afterlife um, through their adaptation into other media. Um, so uh, taking a 19th century novel and turning it into a uh, film, uh, a stage play, or an audio book. Um, and I wondered if the electronic text you're working with are equally susceptible to adaptation, or is their intensely media-specific nature um, somehow change that question, or even the fact that they're using so many different media? It's hard to think about uh, work like 88 Constellations, for example, being made into a book, uh, because the animations are so much a part of the work. Um, it's also hard to imagine it being made into a movie because the fragmentation of the various episodes is so intrinsic to its effect. But I, I would draw here on Rita's idea of the expanded book or the expanded field for works like this. So there is a lot of commentary on the web, for example, on this work, and it uh, may ripple out into various transmedia narratives that aren't uh, this work as such, but are alluding to this work. That's the way I would see it propagating. The, the perfect example here would be a work of net art. Olia Lialina's My Boyfriend Came Back for the War, mm -hmm. which becomes remediated even in the form of a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, and there's, uh, there's projects like Jeff Ryman's uh, 253, which uh, is originally on the web and then published as a novel. I mean, that's not very unusual overall to see certain uh, web works, whether they're uh, electronic literature or uh, blog, blog-based nonfiction, or things like that. Um, but uh, there, there's some examples. Uh, Photopia, an interactive fiction work, actually uh, they began um, uh, work on doing a film uh, version of that, but it uh, didn't continue. What, uh, don't be shy. In the meanwhile, I, I have a sort of general question to pose to our panels while we're waiting for other questioners. Um, w one way to describe at least my experience of today's events is to say that we began sort of elegiacally <laughs> Uh, with references to the uh, decaying beauty of uh, this uh, uh, old dead tree technology uh, and some of the complexities of the, the, the haptic or the tactile dimension of books, the aura that comes upon one when one picks up an old volume and feels the, the, the force of history in it or the force of particular authors in it. So there was a kind of uh, uh, partly elegiac note in the beginning, and now we've moved into a kind of utopian mode in which what we're thinking about are future possibilities and new forms of expression that are now uh, fundamentally enabled 
enabled by the digital technologies. And I'm wondering if there's a way for us to, th uh, to, to identify these two strains in the discourse about the book and whether the panelists think this is a useful distinction. What I have in mind is the way in which we can use digital technology, and I think this has been implied in some of the things that were said earlier today, the ways in which we can use digital technologies to enhance, uh, save, uh, 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 and, 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 and preserve uh, what we might call the print inheritance, the way in which these new technologies either uh, uh, give us new ways for, for, for saving and transmitting the old culture, the, uh, uh, as one one sort of side of the equation, and I, 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 I sometimes feel that this aspect of it is somehow, because it's not sort of exciting for technologists, that it maybe uh, less attention is paid to it, but it, um, uh, there were certainly discussions of that kind of tendency uh, this afternoon. And the, uh, the, other, the other tendency is to talk about the kind of thing that I think is implicit in what uh, both Kate and Rita were saying today, that the new technologies create possibilities, have affordances, as they say, that create unique possibilities for different forms of creativity. My question is, do you think we need to choose between the two? Because very often you hear the utopians uh, being impatient with the old humanists who want to sort of uh, uh, be sure that, that uh, we, we should discover new ways of, of recovering, preserving, and studying Melville's marginalia. Right? That's, bo both enterprises seem to me valuable, but I'm, I'm wondering how the, how the uh, panel feels about it, or whether the formulation is too reductive to be useful. Don't be afraid to say that. Well, one thing that I see happening in contemporary literature are writers like Daniel Levsky, I think Stephen Hall could fall in this category as well, who are reasserting the possibilities of the codex in the digital age. So Daniel Levsky is very adamant that he is writing a codex. He has had multiple film offers for House of Leaves, for example, all of which he's turned down because he sees himself as a print author. But in situating his work within a context, cultural context dominated by digital media, his work is also transforming. So for example, Only Revolutions, which Rita mentioned, uh, is in part a database novel. And so you can see the imprint of digital technologies on that. Same thing is true of House of Leaves. So even those writers who are reasserting the importance, the centrality, and the endless possibilities of the codex are also transforming the form in the very act of engaging the context in which they want to say the codex is still important. So, the, so we shouldn't embrace two, this rigid distinction, but recognize that both, both sides of the equation are, can, can come together in certain practices. Well, I think that was Rita's point in talking about the expanded field. My own term for that phenomenon is a distributed literary system. A distributed literary system that includes a print codex, but has many other aspects as well, some of which are digital. No question. One, one aspect of what you're saying has to do with the, I guess for me, the, or maybe another way of saying what you're saying is the idea of open-endedness, as if the, that the, one way we think of older books is that they come to a conclusion, that they're over, and the implication of even an older book being put in these new platforms and having all this discourse around it is to say that, it, that even that text is no longer singular or, or, or completed, as if it has a kind, not just an afterlife, but an ongoing, continuing life. I mean, I, I, think, I think one wants to be cautious about the um, polarization of that conversation in terms of print on the one hand and digital on the other, such that they're imagined to be self-same and identical to each other, and almost an isomorphic relation. I think the textual field is much more complex than that. Um, and in fact, the volume that Catherine Hales is editing with Jessica Pressman on comparative textual media speaks to the whole range of um, um, uh, textual formats from papyrus, I believe, to, to, the, to print. Um, what I notice about the conversations about the, about the crisis, so to speak, of the book is that they tend to be anecdotal, and, and indeed we saw a lot of that this morning, about subjective impressions 
um, subjective experiences of the loss of the book or the, the disappearance of the library and so forth. And I think the anecdotal is very good for practice. It helps us decide what we want to do with our libraries or our card catalogs. I think it's not as good for theory. It's not as good for understanding what's actually happening. Well, to just speak to the, the dichotomy of print and digital, which we hear so much about now, I think it's useful to recognize that print technology today is digital, that it's more correct to say that books are a particular output form of digital technologies than it is to separate it off as if it were a separate uh, arena. And in fact, I think it's very important to recognize that print technology itself is not one thing. It's undergone these epical shifts all the way from movable type to offset lithography to digital production, such as we have in the present. And so I would like to see these binaries broken up, uh, discussed in more nuanced terms that are more uh, responsive to the technologies that produce that. And we had a wonderful example of that this morning in Bonnie Mack's presentation and others and to uh, be more specific about what we mean, both with print and digital. Great. Yeah, so I have a question I'm about to fall over. OK, um, I just want to set this up a tiny bit by asking you to clarify, and this is for everyone, really. Just when you say book, what I, I mean, I get the impression that what is being meant by book is like, a narrative or a story, like what we, a novel typically. But I mean, there are also other things that we get in print that are not intended to be consumed as that exact object. I mean, you, you have printed screenplays, you have printed plays, um, then there's a wide variety of other forms that have different kind of models of agency with respect to reading. And I was just wondering if any, any of you three could kind of speculate about this, because I mean, it's a question that I've been wrestling with a bit. But I mean, trying to adapt the model of literary agency, where you have readers trying to interpret what a, an author is saying, to more interactive forms, even if those aren't necessarily in digital forms. I mean, there are other models that we could kind of bring to it. I mean, if you look at the way that plays are constructed, that you you don't. I mean, there are a lot of different kind of spaces where agency happens in that. And I, I was just wondering if any of you had thoughts on like agency and reading, basically. Well, I think that's a useful correction to say that not all codex books are, are novels, that there's a whole variety of uh, productions uh, in what we recognize as the codex form. And I also think you're absolutely right in pointing to different reading practices that different kind of communities will bring to the codex depending on the content of that codex. Yeah, the books that are full of random numbers have to be approached differently. Uh, I think, but also actually, uh, you know, manuals and uh, uh, books that are uh, intended to help people uh, understand systems uh, to learn and uh, to uh, approach things through uh, programming or doing calculations, doing exercises, and and uh, and, and working out and solving, right? So um, there, there, I, and this is this is one thing that um, uh, obviously books have served, you know, very very well. Um, in that role, and um, you know, there there were um, uh, there, there's there's uh, 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 a very fascinating relationship to uh, the ways that you know whole books full of not just one line programs but very lengthy basic programs for uh, people to type in um, the, uh, uh, the the way in which those um, programs uh, in a time. W uh, uh, where it's not convenient for people to email something in, how they actually get printed, how they get sent in uh, by uh, contributors and users, um, uh, what types of uh, requirements and, and um, uh, uh, are, are placed on there. So uh, the, the way that early user communities worked and communicated with each other um, had a great deal to do with print. And as I've mentioned in some other contexts, uh, uh, the way that people interact with computers has a lot to do with uh, ink and paper or uh, thermal paper uh, in some cases because print terminals were very uh, frequent in use in the mid-1970s, for instance, and before. And uh, so the it wasn't the screen, but, uh, but actually um, uh, 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 print uh, sometimes ending, ending up 
uh, as I saw you know, with one transcript of someone's playing Zork uh, here at MIT in 1980 at Senior House, um, ending up getting bound into you know, something very codex-like um, that uh, contained the transcript of that play. Uh, Can I ask you a question? I don't think I know this. Did you do any anthropological work or did your team do any anthropological work on the original coding? Um, in other words, how wide of a field do you articulate for this single line? Does it include the programmers at the time as well as the, the um, now? Do you do any sort of autoethnography where you talk about your own executions? I'm, I'm vigorously non-anthropological yeah. um, uh, in, in my approach. Uh, um, are there any people involved, I guess, is another way of putting it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there are 10 of us at least. <laughs> um, our, I mean, one of the things that we, that we did, you know, I mean, we really were looking at this artifact of code itself um, as our focus and not, uh, as not trying to discern, for instance, processes at Commodore at the time that led to its being included in, in the book, but really trying to interpret that um, in, in a more uh, literary sort of mode. Um, what we did is we did have practice-based analysis of this program that involves writing variations of it to see what slight changes in the code would look like, porting it uh, to see what uh, it could or couldn't do on a platform like the Apple II or uh, in Perl or JavaScript, you know, so on. So, um, so we tried to use, pro and, 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 but the, the purpose of that was not to see um, how we, uh, what vernacular theories we ourselves formed about mm -hmm. this, but rather to, um, to understand that through, the, and, and the technology of it through practice. So. Um, those are, those are uh, certainly, uh, those uh, so-called anthropological approaches are certainly legitimate ones to take, um, but that was the way that we approached it because of the group of people who responded to you know, my original uh, message about this. A question over here? I, th I think it's the left first. I th you you want to wait? Yeah, you're up. Yeah. Uh, hi again. Um, I'm Ariel Baker Gibbs. I recently graduated from college last year. So anyway, I was thinking a little bit about how you guys were describing the narrative or the story or the form of the book. And then it occurred to me that really the change that's happened is that now that there are less boundaries, the, the, the realm of the narrative or the story or the fiction or the, I don't even know what you want to call it anymore, but it is now infinite. Is that, is that kind of the direction that you saw this moving? Or do you think that there is ultimately a sort of boundary or a beginning and end now? Yes. <laughs> there are, yes. Uh, there are boundaries, um, there are constraints, there are definitions of the way that uh, different media operate and what's possible, uh, not just uh, technically, but culturally. Um, uh, it's um, not uh, uh, as, as much as I enjoy utopianism sometimes, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not simply a time of uh, complete uh, liberation and freedom for narrative. I mean, yes. Well, I was just thinking concretely about Henry Jenkins' work on transmedial storytelling, the expansion of stories into fan forums and um, theme parks and so forth. But then so too, one would have to point to the third person, the MIT volume, on epic or big narrative diegetic universes. So those two often articulated with, I mean, clearly with parameters, but, but nonetheless, they have the kind of scale that I think you're gesturing toward. Over here. So this is a bit of a follow on, I guess, to David's question, but also something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. So when I hear about the so-called crisis in print. Go into uh, the mic a little more directly. Some of us are having, thank you. Sorry. Um, so when I hear people talk about the crisis in print, I, I, I'm often tempted to think actually the opposite. And I think Rita's distinction that she just made is a very useful one. If I'm thinking from the perspective of a, um, business owner in the print industry or a trained journalist who is, is thinking of, uh, of what the profession was like for the last hundred years, um, uh, it's easy to think about the 
crisis or impending doom, et cetera. From the perspective of someone who uh, studies literature today, I, I, I feel like I see the afterlives of print everywhere, um, and particularly in the fact that the practice of reading is so much more present and prevalent um, in a world where uh, uh, mobile devices, internet, et cetera, are the means through which we're uh, receiving, reading, interacting with, creating texts, um, which is to say that there's perhaps more reading than listening and watching than there was 50 years ago. So that makes me wonder in, in, in my own work, and I'm interested to hear how you all think about this, you know, what are the things that actually are more relevant about practices of reading printed texts uh, because of the, the reading practices involved in the digital? Um, and I guess I'll, I'll push this a little bit further to say that, you know, I'm just as skeptical as the, of the utopian narrative that comes along with people talking about the digital today. But the one place where I'm a bit tempted to get a bit utopian is when I think about, you know, when, when in the 19th century when there were new genres being shaped in print because of the possibilities of the newspaper and, 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 and cheaper print, um, more books, um, there were some, there was quite a bit of utopian thinking about the communities that could be formed um, as a result. And it, it seems to me that the parallels between uh, print and the digital and reading practices provide an opportunity to perhaps look back on those possibilities that you know ended badly or, or however we want to interpret them and, and, and say, well, what could we learn about the possibilities that we're all so excited to talk about today? Um, so I guess it's sort of two parts, w looking at you know, what, does, what actually makes print perhaps more relevant to the digital and, 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 and would you be tempted to pick up on that utopian thread that I just mentioned? I think in thinking about uh, print versus digital text, uh, the editor from MIT who spoke in the previous panel, Gita, mentioned the issue of attention. And a lot of studies have seemed to indicate that reading on the web um, is significantly different on the whole than reading in print. And Bob Stein mentioned this also. It involves a lot more skimming and scanning. Uh, not reading complete text, reading partially along a web page, for example. Whereas a lot of print forms uh, encourage complete text reading. If you're reading an article in New Scientist, for example, there's a tradition that you would read the entire article even if you're now accessing it on print. So one of the questions that has interested and also concerned me is what happens when our print tradition of deep reading kind of uh, collides with the digital uh, practices of shallow, quick skimming and scanning reading. And I, I think there is there are a couple of spin-offs of this. One is the idea that if you print up, if you pick up a print artifact, you're going to spend more time with it, you're going to read it more deeply. Um, another spin-off is that you now begin to see some transfer from di digital reading practices onto print. And I think both of those things are, are now sort of in the, in the dynamic of reading practices. So there's, there's so much to say. Um, but one of the things definitely is that uh, I don't think uh, uh, utopianism should be considered a dirty word or a, a synonym for naivete. If we're talking about consciously constructing a better society due to increasing technological possibilities and what that offers, well, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, and I think, the, I think though it takes uh, some, uh, some concept, it takes some thought about uh, w what that really means. Um, and um, in, this, in, the case of, uh, in the case of reading online, you know, for instance, um, I think there, there were uh, utopian uh, idealists in uh, the mid-1990s uh, who feared uh, that perhaps uh, Disney, you know, and the major networks and so on would own the web. That would be, you know, what, uh, uh, what happened. We would get all of our, that would be the information available online um, in the year 2012. And uh, thanks to those people, uh, that didn't happen. Actually, we many many of us read mostly um, things written by individuals, 
outside of corporations on blogs and from other sources. And we and uh, the, the 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 nightmare was was averted because of positive thinking about what reading and writing could be online and what it meant to have a space. So. Um, I'm not sure that that addresses the, the very narrow uh, uh, and, and precise um, concept there, but um, it's, uh, I think it's important to note that um, uh, if we come to these issues consciously and, and, and pursue them, there, there are possibilities, not that uh, technology drops in our lap, but that, uh, that we can make as a society. I suppose I would add to that that the idea and I suppose rationale behind the experimentation toward increasing literacy and so forth is not particular to print. I mean, we had Bob Stein presenting what is, after all, it seems to me a kind of laboratory for experimentation. To that, you would add vectors and scalar, both out of USC, and an increasing range of, of um, uh, experimental projects that are trying in some way to push the conventions or traditions of print discourse into what you might call a different space, articulated as multimodal. In, in fact, that's what I would say is a major <coughs> contribution of um, electronic literature outside mm. of providing poetic and aesthetic effect is that it encourages that type of uh, deep attention. It's bringing exactly that into um, the context of, of the web where we have other things that are good but not the full environment. But just quickly, Kate, what, what your, when you address this question to start, with, I think this is a very productive conversation. Uh, um, you, you, you distinguished uh, a certain amount of n new research that has shown that reading online or reading on the screen is more distracted and less, less as you said, deep. That uh, my uh, initial reaction as a as a uh, someone born in the in long in the pre digital age and committed to books in certain ways was to was to wonder. Uh, um, or not wonder, but to expect or to hope and to sort of myself, insofar as I'm capable of it, even to work for the idea that deep reading ought to also become an experience on, on, uh, on in electronic environments. And there's no reason, theoretically, to say that shouldn't happen. Uh, it, there's even some suggestion, I think, that some research has been done to say that people have begun to use tablets more in the way they use books. And one, one explanation for that may be that the tactile <coughs> element makes it more resemble the old version of the book. So it is something that you, uh, so it seems to me we're in very early days here and that the, uh, the, these, these um, uh, distinctions between types of kinds of experiences you have online and in the old technologies uh, are still very permeable and changing. A great example of this that I mentioned to you earlier is the forthcoming iPad app for the Talmud, which is absolutely a translation of the experience of deep reading and interpretive labor and so forth to this new format. Well, again, we had talked about this earlier, but one of, some of you may know there's, a, there's an interesting book that sees the Talmud as a precursor of hypertext. Mm -hmm. And there are books like the Talmud or Joyce's Ulysses that actually seem to, uh, uh, theoretically at least, be preferable reads in digital format because they allow for the kinds of connections th those texts demand but that the codex format does not allow. And I suspect that there'll be a lot more of that. There is a digital version of Ulysses being produced now. I'm very eager to see what comes of it because it'll, be a, 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 it'll give you access to aspects of the book's texture that a reading of the hardcover doesn't allow you to do. Mary. Uh, just as a pendant to your comment, David, before I ask my own question, I would want to add as an early modernist that early modern reading was very often not deep reading. Right, there's right. a lot of work on that. Um, the question that I wanted to ask the panelists is sort of about your own reading practices. So the kinds of digital objects and texts that, that you presented on, how do those figure in your own sort of cons recreational consumption? You know, if, if you're gonna sort of go to the, the equivalent of the bookstore for electronic texts, where do you go and how do you choose them and do you curl up with them in the evening? And how do you consume them <laughs> when you're not doing so in a professional capacity? You can even take them into the bathtub. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the electronic literature collection is a great place to go, actually, since uh, uh, Kate and I are uh, editors of the first volume with, uh, with two other collaborators and Rita of the second volume. Um, I mean, 
I like to think we did all that for a reason. <laughs> well, Mary, if I, if I might, I'd like to respond to your question in a kind of idiosyncratic way that takes into account your own presentation this morning. So I gather that in the MIT library, the space that you were exploring is a kind of purgatory. That is, the books aren't quite in the collection, they aren't quite out of the collection, they're sort of there in, in some sort of limbo. Uh, that's in contrast to the UCLA library, which had a practice of selling discard library books. So you could go on your lunch hour and you could browse the stacks. And I made a practice of doing that and I found some absolutely amazing finds such as Samuel Johnson's original edition of Lives of the Poets, for example, and another text from the Revolutionary War. So I started a recycling practice in which I'd buy these books and then send them to less affluent libraries that might in fact want them for that collection. So I found some wonderful old science fiction books and I, I bought those, uh, rare uh, editions that other science fiction collections were missing, sent them to the people uh, who were starting those collections and so forth. So it's just, uh, well, it's a fun little activity, but in any event, there's a kind of recycling aspect to that. I'll mention another activity. At the moment, I'm teaching an undergraduate class in distracted reading, and one of the things we do is keep a week-long information consumption log modeled on the studies from UC San Diego and even um, alluding to the NEA studies and so forth, accounting for our time and counting more specifically for, again, the information we consume and produce. So we keep logs that require our counting the text messages we send and receive and so forth. And the lesson that we've learned is that in the end, all one can do is differentiate screen time from non-screen time that it's immaterial whether I'm reading The New Yorker or a work of electronic literature or comment on a particular novel, blog, et cetera. What matters is that it's within the space of the single screen. So that was, a, that was actually instructive to discover. It, it answers the question about you know, what one does for fun because how do, I, what we've learned is how do you differentiate if you're five minutes reading Ian Hatcher's To Signal to Noise and then browsing over to, to The New Yorker, browsing back to another forum, et cetera can't demarcate space in the same way, which speaks to um, Catherine Hill's work on attention and distraction. And um, according to the program, this part of the forum is supposed to involve all the panelists, so <laughs> I would like to ask a question to Pris Christian Bach. Uh. <laughs> uh, a Wittgensteinian question. So I'm so intrigued by the, um, by the kind of confrontation between the human and the non-human in your Xenotex project. And um, you have mentioned last night and also today in your presentation that you're imagining this as an epical, ep epochal storage, that it will outlast the human race, it will outlast human civilizations and so forth. But for Wittgenstein, for language to have meaning, it has to be shared. It has to have a use context. So let us suppose that you're successful in your microbial encoding. Let us suppose that a billion years from now, the microbe still exists, but human beings and human civilizations don't. Who's going to read it? Well, uh, these uh, are the very same questions that could easily be asked of um, uh, the Voyager probes or the Pioneer probes, uh, they'll persist probably long after humans disappear. Who will get to read them and how will they be able to uh, interpret uh, those artifacts? Uh, it's not important what the message says. Uh, it's important that it just be there. I, I jokingly say that I'm really just spray painting graffiti on an ob obelisk and uh, that uh, by doing so I testify to you know, the presence of a, a, a sentient response to the world. Um, uh, there's no way anybody's going to be able to read a poem that's enciphered in that uh, uh, in that uh, genome, but to uh, signal that it's that it's there, as a uh, it, that its presence is there, testifies to you know the advanced technological civilization that you know occupied the planet. Uh, that that's really what it's about, I think, is 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 pointing to that, or at least is, you know talking about that 
to my own peer group. Right? It's not about addressing any potential uh, audience of the future. In the same way that I think that the Pioneer probe or the Voyager probe really aren't likely ever to address any potential audience of the future. The, the probes are too small. They're only going to come within a few light years of any individual star. And it's unlikely, I think, that a civilization would just stumble upon them. It really is a, a bottle thrown into the ocean uh, with this faint hope that we might you know, uh, uh, preserve some, some testament to our presence on the planet. Um, I look at the book as, as, a, as something akin to a demonic grimoire, really. It's an attempt to, uh, to indulge in a, a much more hellish activity, you know, to, to uh, assert uh, the influence of poetry within uh, the broader milieu of, of life itself, you know, to say that poetry is a way of life, right? and then to try and embody it in uh, an actual living thing, right? you know, to, to point to its uh, significance. At a time when poets are, are insignificant cultural contributors, right? you know, uh, the the most important cultural artifact that has so far been created in terms of sheer income is probably Halo 2, uh, which made more money than any other uh, cultural artifact in human history in l less than a weekend. So I, you know, that, that's the world in which I have to write poetry. You know, I, 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 I'm losing my market share to online porn. Okay, I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so in an effort, in, I suppose in an effort to, to redress uh, those kinds of shortcomings of poetry, I'm, I'm indulging in a very hyperbolic activity. It's really all hyperbole, right? It's an exaggerated experience. Question. Hi, Alison Cooler again. Um, we've talked a little bit about the way the practice of reading is, has changed from the codex to the screen. And I'm very curious about the process of writing. Um, in my own experience, I've gone from using a pen to a typewriter to a keyboard. And I know my writing has changed through those different mediums. And I'm just wondering maybe if any of you who've spoken today would like to address that. You know, how you think the process of of writing has changed over the years, and um, what do you think the consequences of that might be down the road? I can speak just uh, for myself on this score. So um, I've had quite a few years now to produce scholarly books, and one hopes that when produce, one's produces scholarship, a few people read it. But I'm sort of in the position that, that Christian uh, articulated, here I am producing scholarship that, you know, may be read for maybe a few thousand people in my wildest dreams. Certainly nothing like the, um, the production of computer games. So my latest endeavor is to create a computer game. And, uh, okay, if people are now into computer games, let's explore computer games as a medium of writing and uh, of literary production. And what I've discovered in that uh, process is the way that uh, creative writing can flow together with computer codes, can flow together with cryptography, can flow together with dirty little tricks we want to play on our players. And uh, it's actually been quite exhilarating. So for me, it's a radical change in my writing practice and in the relationship I imagine with my readers or players in this case. I can just mention that you can, all, you can um, create computer games and still have very few people uh, read <laughs> or uh, <laughs> otherwise encounter them. Um, not, not to deflate anything, but um, I, I, there's a lot of, I mean, one of the, I think this issue of, of actual, you know, um, material apparatus of writing and the nature of the computer, I mean, uh, as much as I, I'm very interested in computation itself, which is why I, I look at a computational artifact rather than a networked uh, computer system, you know, in, in this recent book. Um, but a lot of, uh, I think a lot of what actually transforms uh, writing experience for me has to do with a network and not uh, so much new uh, computational uh, capabilities, uh, not so much uh, things that couldn't be done uh, in longhand or with a typewriter. So being able to uh, collaborate with others online uh, and write in the same document uh, at the same time, uh, or uh, write in a system that's tracked and, and versioned, uh, like in MediaWiki, is uh, uh, tremendously uh, significant. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's significant to be online or not when one is writing. Um, to uh, have to uh, book tickets on a long-distance uh, Amtrak train 
um, in order to um, write without distraction, uh, because one cannot be online, uh, you know, is uh, is a different situation um, uh, to 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 be in. And so, um, I mean, there are things about you know, I I, I write at coffee houses, and I, um, you know, uh, there I don't I don't mind certain types of uh, distraction or um, uh, certain types of environment in that uh, in, in those sorts of ways. But um, but I think that that's a big issue. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, you know, writing in a cabin, um, uh, longhand with a typewriter with a computer um, offline, or writing in, in a coffee house, um, or you know, writing with a network connection, um, it, the, the, the difference between the particular instrument of writing that's being used doesn't seem to me uh, nearly as significant. So to this discussion of the inevitable digitization of our writing practices, I would just add one other note. So Mark Danielewski's only revolutions for all of the complexity of its visual layout and certainly for all of the software that was required in order to formulate the page space um, came down to the use of note cards for the use of the dates in the central columns. So even there one sees a, um, that, one, you, that there's, no, there's in a way no such thing as a, a radical break, nor would, would one would, would, nor would one want to think in those terms. Question. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan Bohan. I'm a recent uh, uh, library school graduate. And my question is, um, in this whole discussion of distracted reading, I'm wondering if there's any consideration or, or thought given to people who already have a problem with distraction, <laughs> people with ADD, people with learning disabilities. There's a lot of people <laughs> with those problems. And like I, I have ADD, and just even trying to read anything online, I can't, can't do it for more than 20 seconds. I'm or onto something else. So how, do, how does that, would, is there any effect on how, how people would write for, for that sort of situation? Well, what I've noticed is um, a tendency among print authors to respond to distracted reading. So a good example of that for me would be the exploit, uh, Alexander Galloway and Eugene Thacker. So they, uh, in part of their print book, they've provided short summaries. So you can actually just read the bolded lines and get a sense of the argument. And moreover, they've divided into a kind of modular fashion so you can skip around and still get a sense of what the book is about. So they're presuming readers who are not going to read continuously page after page, but rather are going to skip around or going to maybe only read the bolded lines in some sections and so forth. So <clears throat> I think that distracted reading is now becoming not just a reading practice, but um, a cultural practice to which writers are responding. It's, it's a fascinating question. What would be the literary equivalent for Neville Dean and Taylor, for instance, the directorial team? I think the closest thing we have is Talon Mehmet's Lexia to Perplexia, which <coughs> makes normative, makes the standard, the state of perplexity. So in other words, rather than thinking about a kind of deviation from uh, long forms of narrative, deviation from sustained um, practices of attention, it makes disorientation, the standard, from which one would have to imagine that a shift back to what, we're, what we now regard as traditional forms of reading would be the deviation. Yeah. Just, I'm compelled to make this one comment about distracted reading. Like, let's say, you know, what it, you're listening to music, like as you're reading, perhaps, right? And that's, that's distracted reading. So, I mean, why isn't that distracted music listening? Maybe it's the reading mm -hmm. that's distracting you from the other activity. I mean, if you, were, if you were reading while you're driving, you wouldn't be like, oh, I'm doing distracted reading. <laughs> you know? So, I, I mean, you, there, there is this media ecology in which, you know, different things yeah. are, are, are happening. And, uh, and I think, I mean, they, you know, like unplugging the network cable and hiding it somewhere, locking it, you know, I mean, those are, the types of uh, responses that, that are appropriate. Uh, if you want to actually um, engage with something on a computer, a uh, piece of interactive fiction, a piece of electronic literature, or some work, um, uh, without uh, all the concomitant uh, you know, network sort of distractions, 
Uh, you can, uh, Commodore 64 would be a great system to use, actually. <laughs> you can think, too, of the whole suite of, of um, uh, add-ons and plugins that have been developed in order to create what one might call a sort of page space online. Readability is the most well-known example, I think. I understand in California there are now slow internet cafes where you have only a dial-up modem, and so you sit there and drink your coffee and wait for the message to appear on the screen. You know, if you think back to the earliest designs of word processing programs, you can see a drama like this going on, because in the very beginning, certain people who used the word processing programs for the first time, they were obviously analog people, uh, were very offended by even the minimal menu that they found so all, so they, they used to require they, they used to have an, an ad a, 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 a choice you could make where you could have the whole screen blanket just like a blank paper but I think what one of the interesting things is of course how how quickly people got used to the idea of distractions in the margins of the page as simply an experience of how you work and now they rule it out not unlike I think the way people watching television for 40 years close their ears and eyes to the commercials they were sitting in front of. So I, I mean, I think there is a process of uh, uh, a, 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 a getting used to process that's clearly operating in the digital world in, in ways that are changing our, our, our uneasiness about the strangeness of these new environments that, in which we read and write. I have to ask, how many people read on their phone, on their smartphone? Are there some? I, this is such a great. Um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is such a great uh, thing because th the, that is a device that is designed to interrupt you. Its purpose is to stop you from what you're doing so that you, know, you take the phone call, right? Um, I mean, it, it's exactly the opposite of what you would want in, in a reading device. It's like having your doorbell as a reading, or you know, I mean, something like, no. Um, and, uh, and so it's a system that is growing out into a general purpose computer if the corporate superstructures will allow it. But, um, but you know, it, it, there's something about the fundamental nature of that system. Whereas this, what is this, you know, right here? It's a book. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, you know, Alan Kay's Dynabook, your PowerBook, your MacBook, all, I mean, these are, these, th this is a notebook computer, you know. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, on the left first, you're second, you're next, you're first. Hi, Evan Knight. Um, I'm curious as to who's publishing or if it's online, who is hosting the, um, the works that Ms. Rayleigh and Ms. <coughs> Hales talked about. So in other words, like, who's publishing it, who's paying for it? Okay, so uh, I will mention the Electronic Literature Collection because um, it has collected together in, in the mode of anthology David Clark's um, 88 Constellations, not Ian Hatcher's Signal to Noise. Um, Talon Memmott's Lexia Perplex Perplexia was in the first volume. So there are these um, collection projects. So they're not publication exactly, but, but we do host. So it's a kind of republication, although the terminology starts to fall apart a little bit at that point. And I'll just mention that the editorial and curatorial work for both the Electronic Literature Collection 1 and Collection 2 was uh, strictly pro bono. So there was no, never any expectation that we, any of us would make a profit, and indeed it cost us money to uh, produce the CDs and DVDs that went along with the uh, two collections. And uh, many people felt that it was redundant to produce a DVD of electronic literature collections. But uh, I think that was uh, maybe uh, short-sighted and had in mind only a US context. Because when I traveled to places like Croatia, people were extremely happy to get the DVD because they either didn't have internet access or it was very expensive for them. So I think. Uh, actually, it, it, even though it was a negative income stream, <laughs> it was a quite worthwhile project. Plus, it allows you to disconnect your computer from the network while you read the electronic <laughs> literature. With, with that being said, uh, what sort of role do you think like an expanded book, uh, uh, so with ancillary, ancillary materials uh, in addition to just the text, uh, what role would that expanded book play in traditional sort or more traditional even scholarly publishing? 
Um, and, and it is an important question. What is the relationship between the electronic literature community as we imagine it to um, the MFA world, or rather to the world of letters, right? Um, industry, essentially. Um, it's certainly the case that th there's no commercial model, there's no commer viable commercial model. I always think the iTunes um, uh, model might be one that could be adopted. Um, but it, it's very much, um, they're very much amateur efforts. Even though there are dedicated creative writing programs like at Brown, um, the MFA program where John Cayley works, that's, that um, produces MFA students who, who work with um, computational media. Nonetheless, there is a sense in which this type of writing practice is situated outside of the economies of literary production that have developed over the last few centuries. To me, it's quite an open question what publishing is going to mean in the near future, or even right now. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to publish a digital companion in my print book, uh, how we think that's coming out very shortly. And um, I, sub I wrote a grant proposal to get some money to do this. Part of the grant proposal required uh, me to state my plans to publish it. And I thought about that. So I'm going to host the site. I'm going to pay for the site. What would it mean for the University of Chicago Press to publish this work? As far as I could figure out, what it would mean is that they would put their name on it. I was doing all the work. I was hosting it. Why, in fact, would I want them to put their name on it? Uh, maybe I do want them to put their name on it. I take that back. But you, you, see, the, you see the issue here. When you start uh, publishing things yourself, what is the role of the press, or the university press in particular? And this morning we heard Gita make an argument that the, uh, the role of the university press is to maintain editorial control. Uh, but then we heard Bob Stein say, well, everybody now can be an editor. I expect that the very fine job that editors like prestige presses like MIT do is not going to be done as well by general public type people who may choose to serve as editors at Bob Stein. But we live in an age now where hardly anybody except Christian Bach takes 10 years to write a book. A uh, useful scholarly <laughs> lifetime of a book now is about three years. And so is there really a point to have these polished jewels where immense amounts of editorial work go into them when the lifetime, the useful scholarly lifetime of books is increasingly diminishing? I can see an argument for saying, open up the editorial floodgates. Let everybody be an editor. Yes, quality standards will go down, but you'll get a lot more books, and maybe it's a, it's a offset to have many more books with less careful editorship and curation um, than it is to have scholarly presses maintain a kind of funnel effect on what gets published. And I would invite Gita now to respond <laughs> to this uh, provocation in particular. One quick note, this seems like the, the sort of economic question here is how this kind of work gets funded. And uh, David Clark's work is funded by grants from the Canadian Council for the Arts. And it does seem there are large arts organizations in Canada that are funding fantastic projects. Christian's work has also been benefited from large grants. I don't know of, of comparable institutions in the US that are funding, at least the digital humanities are incredibly well funded uh, in the US. I'm not sure about digital artworks and the granting foundations for that sort of endeavor. Just a, a side note. I think you're right. I think there's a, a marked scarcity of such agencies in the U.S. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, um, Kate. I wanted to respond by saying that we're asking similar questions you stand, about... Stand up so everyone can stand up. So people we're, can. we're asking very similar questions at the MIT Press about the usefulness of the highly reviewed, highly edited, highly polished uh, monograph. Um, and is that something that is still valued? Is it something that we still want to invest so many resources in? And I think right now we do. Um, we're willing to make that investment for the record, for scholarship, for the future. Um, but that doesn't in any way conflict with your point that 
Other people can be editors as well. One's own scholarly community can edit one's work, and, 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 uh, and that can be a very productive process that can uh, complement what we do as university press editors. So if you came to me with a project that your community had vetted and whose quality uh, it had established and, and, and if that community had given you useful advice for revising the work and you brought it to me at that point after you'd made that, those revisions, I would say, do I have any remaining questions as, uh, as, a, as an editor um, about this work, and can I get those answered by consulting more people, or is this ready to go? My questions at that point might be more commercial. They might be, you know, about who is the audience for this work, and I might want to do additional review to determine that. We have only a few minutes left. So let me ask the audience to be succinct and the panelists to be equally succinct. Think of it as a sort of final lightning round. I love uh, Gita's uh, refreshing, as a uh, publisher, uh, refreshing view of the ambiguity of the costing and economics. Um, we're in a, such a, a volatile interplay between the two displays, uh, paper and screen, for the one umbrella book, that we, ha we have to kind of look, uh, look around for other models. I just want to offer one very briefly. Um, paper making and printing emerged as completely autonomous crafts for completely different agendas. Uh, uh, one was a debossing, useful for making pilgrim badges, and the other was a substitute for textiles. Well, what occurred was that those two independent technologies began slowly to merge. And in fact, by the um, 18th and 19th century, you could not distinguish the product of paper from the product of print in publication. Uh, think of a, a circus broadside or a, a daily newspaper. So they not only emerged but came, became a third <laughs> phenomena and technology of their own. And even that merge, the printing always gets the most attention because it's construed, because it's, it's more directly a conveyor of content, it's construed as a, a, a high um, domination of uh, transitions in politics and, uh, and uh, ideologies and in literature. But uh, paper is never mentioned because it doesn't have that same uh, immediate relationship with content. But here's, here's the kicker. There's a third factor that was even more crucial than the merge of paper and printing. It was the commodification of books commercially by book binders. Remember, printers only print sheets of paper. They don't make books. So commodification stages have to be fulfilled and played out as well. So I'm offering that that's an earlier model that can be brought to the functionality of the relationship of uh, the two displays of paper and screen in books. Thank yes, you. On the next okay. question. Uh, I just have a very quick question. It seems to me that this should be something like a wake. I mean, a celebration. Like, we should be dancing in the streets, we should be drinking champagne, celebrating the death of the print book. And, I, I mean, I'm being perhaps provocative here, but I cannot think of a single negative aspect of the decline of the print book. And I'll just give you a quick example of two things that might be, pers might be, uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, that might be perceived as negative. Uh, on the one hand, private entities have difficulty uh, making profit, but doesn't the, uh, the free flow of information far outweigh the cost that gatekeepers have difficulty obtaining profit? And the second issue has to do with this idea of uh, distracted reading. There's work on embodied cognition, 
And really, I think what's going on is, rather than distract reading, is that the computer, the tablet, is actually part of our cognition, our long-term memory is stored in this. And I'll just give a very quick example. If you look at the Flynn effect, IQ points have increased over the past 70 years. And the dominant explanation is that you know, we actually have this sort of distributed cognition with the computer. So uh, I would like to hear the panelists' response. Just the one word response to the first part of your comment, no. <laughs> and, uh, I can give the, uh, my question is the seven word response to that more or less, but, uh, and, here's the, and here's really the question that this is about me about everything that gets said from the beginning to the end of the conference. We started off looking at 2,000 year old books that we can read today. We have Christians that nobody will be able to read in a billion years, and because there won't be anybody to read it uh, if it ever happens, and besides which it doesn't matter what it says, and it could be saying nothing. Now, if we actually have some content that's worth keeping, perhaps the electronic literature that's being created today in media that in five years uh, will uh, dissolve or are fugitive or not be able to be read or uh, go the way of all of the other uh, eight tracks and, and stuff, uh, what do we have in terms of the creative work that's being done now electronically that's going to ensure the readability of it the same way that that book that he wants to get rid of can be read in another 2,000 years, the same book that we read 2,000 years ago? Well, if you carve that text in stone, it would last even longer. <laughs> I, I mean, there's different systems for different things. It's, uh, it's you know... Uh, not the case. This this program is in a book that will last a long time, you know. So uh, there there are there are ways to uh, to to address those questions as authors, as creators of work, as preservationists. Um, but there are also different things that different objects do culturally. And I think one of the things about the reason that we shouldn't be um, having a, a revel uh, at the uh, demise of the book, uh, aside from the fact that it's not dead, is um, uh, it has to do with all of the cultural history and uh, cultural cognition that's wrapped up in the development of that book and what it means. And the, along with things like uh, perhaps oppressive regimes and concepts of authorship and, and copyright and so you know, but also uh, very positive things. And so we have the chance now to pick those things out and uh, to figure out uh, in uh, uh, in that utopian mode, you know, wh what of this um, do we want to bring into the next version of the book. I mean, just it's worth mentioning that the Electronic Literature Organization has devoted a lot of time and energy to thinking about this problem. And I think I saw on the table out there a copy of the white paper on the Preservation Archiving Dissemination Initiative. If not yeah, there, it would be on the Acid Free Bits is out there. Um, there should be several copies still um, that are free for the taking. Uh, so it, it's something that we've looked into. Um, but uh, that, that's not the single uh, metric for the value of a medium. Uh, the, the, the duration of time that it preserves a message. Uh, I mean, it's one of the things in a cultural system you know, that uh, is worth considering along with a lot of other factors. Final question, final comment. So one of, one of the sort of more dystopian things that disturbs me that nobody has brought up is just how much of the digital record is proprietary and how the digital has actually fostered that. And just what, what a tremendous amount of scholarship is behind paywalls and you know the libraries that are paying millions and millions of dollars for this material. And the e-books that we're buying to replace print are less accessible. They're, they have really heavy DRM, they can't be shared, they, can't, they can barely be printed. They're much more difficult to use than printed books. And so I just wanted to throw that out there as a tempering. Yeah, as a practical matter, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, one of the responses is both volumes of the Electronic Literature Collection are Creative Commons licensed, and you can Take those disks that are out there for you to get for free and copy them to your hard drive, if you like, and, and, and distribute them, you know, otherwise. Uh, you, you, I mean, so we, we, that this is one way, you know, actively that we, that we try to deal with this from the standpoint of our realm of practice and criticism of looking at electronic literature. It's a very severe issue. It's, it's the type of thing that, that uh, people in the mid-90s concerned about the web, you know, are, are dealing with. Um, 
and uh, and this and 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 the question of should we uh, embrace the commodification of the book as a critical uh, point, uh, I, I think bears on this issue. Do do we need a proprietary um, uh, model for what the book will be? Um, no, I, I I don't think so. That's why I run free software, and that's why right. But that's why you, as available. scholars, need to help us. Us librarians. Basically, I mean, it, it's not enough Thanks. to just create your new scholarship in open as open open access. What you really need to do is help work against the current system, in which thousands and thousands of academic journals are just locked up. And yes, sign up at the no cost one. of knowledge. <laughs> dot com to oppose Elsevier um, and uh, work to, but I think starting with work in one's own practice and making it available. Tenprint, uh, the book that I'm doing with uh, nine others, thanks to the MIT Press, will be Creative Commons license. It's going to be made available in digital version for free online. It will also be a beautiful book object that uh, will be two color printed with custom in papers and will be very carefully designed and laid out to the advantage of someone who wishes to read that version. I, I mean, this is, but, but I, I don't think you should stop at, you know, making your own work Creative Commons or otherwise opening it. I think that uh, it does need to be addressed institutionally. It's, it's a very serious issue, and we're in a situation where libraries, uh, I mean, MIT doesn't pay for uh, bundling, but other people don't have the same uh, other other institutions don't have the same sorts of uh, uh, of uh, uh, advantages. Uh, they, they are they are greatly restricted in um, um, in what can be done with the scholarly record that's you know paid for by institutions, volunteer labor of people. Uh, I could go on for a while, but we need to stop. <laughs> I'd like to thank the audience and thank the panelists. <laughs>